let, let's uh, move on from one spectrum to the other spectrum. You've, uh, you know, Chief of Air Force has always been the air domain capability manager. Mm. You've now taken on the role of space uh, capability manager. Uh, I just wonder what that means for you in terms of uh, where Air Force goes from now and, and maybe you could give us a bit of vision. Yeah, a bit of vision. Um, if I could just um, make one comment yeah. there. You've said um, uh, to pick up capability management in the space domain. Uh, we've, all, we've always had that, in fact. So we've been a capability manager for space control for some time mm -hmm. now. Um, we have an air and space operations centre. <clears throat> Largely, we use capabilities that, that we see and, and uh, have access to from the US, so, and which we're very grateful for. Uh, but indeed, Australia's geography allows us to contribute significantly into space domain awareness and space control. Uh, and you know, that is managing satellites and where you want to put capabilities, um, looking and using assets such as a space telescope um, or a space surveillance telescope to be able to assess what's happening in space. And once you've got that, that's called space domain awareness. Once you've got that, then you can start to look at how you, how you can manage and control how you best use space and use it for the benefit of our national interests and indeed the, the national interests of all nations in our region and all nations in the globe. Uh, the use of space is quite unregulated. Uh, so our ability to understand what's happening in space allows us to, to get a better idea of how we can actually start to do that as an international um, contributor. Uh, so as a capability manager, we, we look after space control. Uh, my colleague, the Chief of Joint Capabilities, is the capability manager for space services. Uh, and that's things like GPS and um, uh, satellite communications. So those things are really key and affect the everyday lives of Australians. Uh, we all rely on GPS. Uh, our mobile phones are connected to it. The signals that we get for communication, a lot of those come from satellites. Really important capabilities that not just um, you know, the aspect of military capability, but most importantly, it supports our way of life and it's what's important to Australia and our national interest. So um, the opportunity here um, is the emerging role that I'll, I'll have, and that is of space, what we're calling the lead of the space domain, space domain lead. Uh, and that's an opportunity to really then start to optimise, uh, integrate, prioritise across all of those aspects of space so that we can, we can understand what it is we need to do. What's, our, what's Australia need to do in space that best delivers against our national interests? What does our government want? What are the policy settings that government wants for us in space? How do we engage with industry to best achieve that? And indeed, how do we engage with our international partners in particular to ensure that we can do that across a, a very gripped up, coordinated um, and appropriate management of space across the interna international community? That's the functions that a space domain lead will have uh, and, uh, and it's coordinating, it's about influence um, and within those areas such as space control as the capability manager where I would direct. Uh, but I do that um, coordinated through the requirements that the Chief of Defence Force will have and he will execute his command and intent through the strategic centre. So once again it comes back to, for us um, to deliver in accordance with the strategic intent um, what our directives are. Uh, and the ability in our Air Force strategy to start the path where we will be delivering. And I've, I've focused on the delivery of air power effects, certainly, but we are talking also about the delivery of space power or space power effects. I think Australia is a fair way from being able to actually um, own and deliver space power itself, um, but it's coming. You know, in our investment program, there are capabilities um, coming up pretty quick and in time you might say is not a luxury that we have uh, when it comes to space. There's capabilities we're already introducing and we need to start to deliver a, ro a robust means of managing, governing and operational delivery to force assigned capabilities into the joint operation space or area so that we can actually um, deliver on those requirements that we might have in the space domain. So um, a great opportunity. Yeah, it's a fascinating area and I, I think from the general public doesn't really understand how dependent our, our everyday life is on mm. the continuation of uh, um, the satellites that are up there. I don't think a lot of people realise that the biggest piece of free infrastructure is actually the USAF's GPS yeah. uh, satellite net network. 
Now, now with that role, I, I suppose one of the challenges, and certainly one I remember from my time, was was actually having sufficient people to execute what you wanted in in this in mm. the area of space. So, did your strategy start to address address that? Yeah. So um, we've got five lines of effort in the yeah. strategy, uh, and the first the first key one really is about um, Air Force delivering air power as a part of the joint force. Uh, the next one really is about a, um, continuing to develop and build our intelligent and skilled workforce. So um, your question there about um, about workforce and the skills, that's a vital part of the space domain. Uh, and we, uh, I think what we do is when we, when we build and look at capabilities and our investment forward and, and the systems we might acquire, we do actually have to do a better job of understanding how we build um, the skills, the necessary outcomes that will require a work of the workforce, of the people that actually deliver these capabilities for us. And that's a, that's a non-trivial task. Uh, the previous, or the current white paper, 2016, uh, does talk to that, but probably not quite enough at the moment. So, and the white paper development, our engagement with government, um, I think the considerations that I'm taking around the Air Force strategy, while we draw on the strategic centre, um, for our guidance and, and make sure we're aligned with the strategic intent from the centre. It also gives me an opportunity to develop and look at our strategy and look at what we need to do and I can feed that back into the continu continuing evolving nature of strategy, both uh, for the ADF and defence, but it also gives us a chance to then have that conversation with government too about what's coming next. Um, how do we innovate in space? Um, how do we innovate in our workforce? Um, how do I make and uh, make gains and efficiencies in the current workforce to trade off to get those workforce and reskill them to go into the space environment. How do I coordinate that across Navy, Army, uh, and indeed our civilian elements of the Defence Force as well, as the Department of Defence, um, so that we can best deliver these capabilities in the space domain. So it would be safe to say that this, this is a priority, Air Force, a priority area for Air Force? It, it's a... Um, well, it's a priority area for the joint force. Oops, um, and my role as the lead in the space domain will be to ensure that we can um, understand what the priorities are and how we will best uh, deliver on, on the capabilities we'll need for that. Um, certainly, it's a focus for Air Force. Uh, Air Force has uh, a number of the key expertise that I think would, would also align with what's required in space. Um, our command and control structures to deliver air power are very similar and aligned to the structures we'll need to deliver a command and control for space. So we can bring some of those characteristics and as I've said, we've already established the Air and the Australian um, Space Operations Centre um, that's linked into the other uh, international operations centres and we lead on that from an Air Force perspective as the capability manager for it. Uh, so it is a focus for Air Force, but I, once again, I emphasise that we can't do this alone. Um, we, we need the support and, and Navy and Army um, need access and need the opportunities to use capabilities in space as well and they have systems that they will need to develop and provide their people um, to support those capabilities uh, as we deliver. So it's probably fair to say there's there's a job in educating everybody on the importance of space in, mm -hmm. in modern operation as well. Well, with that, we might we might move on to, you know, the establishment. Sorry, if I just, yeah, yeah. just go back on that, Jeff. Um, I think you're dead right, educating people on space. Um, Certainly the, the civilian community industry, they're doing a lot of work on it and there's education that's out there, but that's very much focused on the civilian requirements for space. So some of those aspects that, that are important to us in terms of defence and, and, and our mandates for under defence policy uh, is for how we can protect our assets, maintain our awareness, control the assets. Um, how do we make everyone aware and smarter on that? How do we improve our the defence value proposition in terms of managing and, and protecting our interests linked to what's in the space domain. Uh, Williams Foundation is a great vehicle to help us do that. So uh, um, I'm sure there'll be a lot more to come from Williams uh, as well in, in terms of getting some of these discussions forward, uh, you know, tackling some of the hard questions and starting to d deliver for us the opportunity to, to pull, you know, uh, new smart thinking people, um, educate young folk who have great uh, opportunities for innovation, un un unencumbered by risk in some ways. Uh, so how do you bring those sort of people in? And I think uh, Williams Foundation's got a great opportunity to give us a leg up in that regard. So I, I welcome your help. Well, I, I think we've certainly taken that on board <laughs> and uh, uh, I think 
not our next seminar, but the seminar after, we'll certainly concentrate on space. So we'll uh, look to work closely with yourself and yeah. everybody else in the ADF so that we can explore that area. I suppose the next thing I'd like to look on is as as the Air Force's work towards a fifth generation Air Force, and you could also say a, a fifth generation ADF as well as we start to look at Navy and Army capabilities that are coming in. When you look at raise, train and sustain going forward, especially for the joint joint force, mm -hmm. um, given the sort of capabilities that all three services have in that area, some of the security considerations around that, do you think we're adequately set up to be able to train fully with that fifth generation force? Yeah, um, we're getting there. Um, I think I'll just touch on one thing, a mm. fifth generation. Um, and I think uh, that was a very useful tagline for us um, to deliver the almost the transformative change that we needed to deliver to bring our Air Force and the Joint Force forward into what we now call the fifth generation. Um, You'd much rather use multi-domain operations? So. Oh, th that certainly yeah. is the case yeah. now, without yeah. doubt. Um, and, and to us, it's now, we're, we're almost now past fifth generation, we're now looking at what's the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, Navy are using that as they start to look at their shipbuilding program and the you know, key capabilities that as they deliver air warfare destroyer and as they'll deliver the future frigate. Um, so, and the future submarine, of course, as well. So, and of course, um, our land force very much looking at digitised, you know, digitising the land force. Our very key capabilities with sensors on board, smart systems. How do we integrate that into the, what we've called the fifth generation? Well, it's now moving past that, and I think it's moving past that quite rapidly. Uh, but our thinking has to be very innovative and progressive as we continue to do that. Um, so, you know, how do we train? Um, if I look purely at something like an F-35, then, you know, the virtual systems that we're bringing into place, the only true way you can stress um, our training system, and, and indeed stress the whole system, I think will be through virtual means. Um, you know, the, the F-35 is a very smart aeroplane. You can't fool it by putting up notional adversaries. Uh, it's, we have to be better at that. And how do we do that? Well, probably virtual means is one of the key areas. Certainly uh, um, live, virtual and constructive characteristics will be essential to our fit, what we've called fifth generation um, training. So what's our next generation of training to support our capabilities moving forward? It's got to start to come to that end. So that's just the F-35, but I need to be able to do that now with Navy, uh, with Maritime Force and Land Force. Um, how do we exercise that across the Joint Force? That's, that's a really huge challenge for us. Collective training uh, becomes a, a very key part of how we're delivering air power capabilities and the air power effects that we need. Certainly that will be needed for what we'd call high-end high -end warfighting. So if we fail to achieve what we need in the cooperation in the competition environment, which is a large part of our current strategic environment, if we don't succeed there, if we don't win in that area, then we probably will find ourselves in conflict and then we will have to be good at doing that high-end warfighting. Uh, so I also want to think about how I do virtual, uh, live virtual constructive and training uh, in that competition space. There's a lot of very key strategic issues that we'll have to be able to respond to in an agile um, and, and very uh, deliberate way. Uh, so how do we keep that across whole of government and bring whole of government into this as well? So uh, testing that, what does an F-35 do in that sort of space? How, you know, we imagine that as the high-end warfighting capability. Well, there's other things it can do as well. So you know, the full spectrum of air power capabilities that we possess through airlift, airborne early warning and control, um, surveillance, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets, um, our growlers with electronic warfare capabilities and the F-35, which is a game changer for how we manage it. It's a it has such strategic effect and capabilities and how we best use those. Um, I just don't think we realise that yet. And that's, that's one of the things we're really trying to get to in our Air Force strategies, how to bring that forward. And of course, training, preparedness, um, collective training, they, they become very, very key to how we do that. And then educating, how do I also explain all that? How do I bring forward air power value proposition for what we can do for the nation across whole of government? And indeed, how do we do that for the Joint Force? Um, so the whole of government is more aware of what we as a Department of Defence, what defence 
uh, the defence organisation and the defence force can do to support those uh, those requirements for our national interests. Yeah, and I, I agree with you totally. And I, I think the importance of being able to do that joint training, um, which has always been difficult, um, especially in large live exercises. I was always taken with uh, Waddington in the UK, um, where they they actually had a whole lot of fighters there, and in, in Afghanistan they actually brought in the TACP, and and they trained the joint team in the virtual environment before mm. they sent them to Afghanistan. Mm. So they established the trust and sort of relationships. And I've often wondered here, um, even though it's not a program record for us, whether if we didn't have a Waddington or a, or a Fallon sort of thing with an air warfare destroyer or an Anzac frigate ops room, as well as the fighters, as well as the army, all in one mm. large virtual environment, whether that would be an ideal joint training environment. I just wonder what your comments on that Yeah, no, I, I, ditto. Yeah. I think uh, you hit the nail on the head. Um, and there's projects underway. So uh, Warren McDonald is the Chief of Joint Capabilities and Jonathan Mead now just uh, recently um, uh, announced for promotion and, and to pick up that role in the future. Um, they're delivering capabilities. Uh, uh, there's a, a project um, 9711, I think it's called, mm -hmm. uh, which is coming to the heart of just that. Yep. So how do we better deliver on, on this type of level of training across the joint force um, so that we can do it efficiently, effectively, and indeed stress, stress the force so that we can really test and make sure that we, you know, we're delivering our capabilities, but aren't they going to work? How do we ensure that they're optimised and integrated? How do we synchronise the, the planning and the, the operational execution of these? How do we bring those aspects into um, Joint Operations Command, uh, given that CJOPS will, will be the key player to really synchronise and integrate these capabilities to deliver them? To deliver them in an operational space. Now, that's a real challenge, um, non-trivial, and it goes to the point you, you, you used before, and that's multi-domain operations. Uh, how do we do that in multi-domain command and control? Uh, that's what we really have to get after, and to do that, to test it and stress it, we have to be able to train it. Yeah, and, and I suppose I'm a little out of date these, these days, but uh, certainly in my time, I just felt that while we emphasised our own individual training, whether it be in Army, Navy or Air Force, we just probably didn't put enough emphasis on the need to put it together in terms of how you do it collectively and how you do it efficiently and build it. Uh, and I'd, um, I think you know, we have to be able to train yeah. in our own environments first. That's, you know, what's our core skills? We've got to build up those core skills and then we can employ them in the joint, joint environment. And, it, you know, I talk about Air Force, it's, we're Air Force, but our, what we do is deliver air power. And indeed in the future, air, air and space power. So we've got to be able to prepare and train for that. What, uh, one of the aspects of the, um, the Air Force strategy is the line of effort around you know, a, a, part of, a key part of the Joint Force. Um, it's, and, and the other efforts around intelligent and skilled workforce. We're also, uh, we have a line of effort around evolving culture. Uh, and uh, those, when you pull those together, it's now we're starting to talk about how do we prepare our people to be able to do this. So your yeah, training and the platforms, that's, that's great and that's what we're good at and that's at the tactical level. But what we're also trying to build is um, people in the Air Force that have a better understanding of um, the strategic environment, a better understanding of what it means to think strategically. Um, we want to build their strategic acumen so that when it comes to these sort of questions, uh, they know what to do, how to engage with their colleagues and, en and engage in a confident sense so that they can be heard um, and can influence in the joint space so that we can deliver air power capability to its best effect. Uh, we have to be able to give voice to Air Force. We have to be able to explain um, how we deliver air power. So that's about um, you know, how, how do we want to be seen um, in the joint environment and indeed the, the broader international environment across whole of government as well. Um, so not only how we want to be seen, but how we are seen. Um, so building those aspects, and that's, that's one of the lines of effort in our Air Force strategy, is to, is to better articulate that. So that all members of Air Force have a better understanding of, of what's required, what they need to be able to do, and then to give them the opportunities to achieve that. And not everyone's going to do that, of course. Um, and I talk to the CEOs uh, when they first come into their role, as every 
chief of air force has done before me you know i appoint to command as the chief of air force so i want to have a, a good strong dialogue with our commanding officers and i expect a lot of them um, and i want them to be able to deliver at the tactical level the air power effects that we need but i also want them to understand uh, what's happening at the strategic level and the implications of everything that they and their workforce do and what impact that has at the strategic level. And I'm asking them to then look at their workforce and say, well, who are those in your workforce that we highly value for what they deliver in the tactical, um, in the tactical space? And make use of them, build them for that, encourage them, support them, enable them for that. But then there's others in that workforce that have aspirations and, and um, characteristics and attributes that allow them to be very skilled and gifted as they look towards the strategic environment. So give those people the opportunity as well and bring them forward. Um, uh, between all of that in the workforce, that's what delivers this air power and air power effects in a, in, a, in a stronger and more agile way to be able to put that into the joint force and be aware of it. And it also positions our people to be um, far more str strategic in their thinking um, more competitive for roles in the joint force and by doing that we'll be, be able to better understand what the joint force needs and indeed be able to influence better um, air power effects into the joint force. So this is a you know really pulling all of this together. Multi-dimensional. It's once know. again multi-dimensional but it's um, and it's not something different uh, that we've it's not that we haven't done this in the past um, but the platform I've been given with Air Force now allows me to focus a lot more on that. Uh, and that's probably the key difference in the Air Force strategy is starting to deliver on those You're giving things. a clearer articulation of your requirements than I think yeah. we've previously. Yeah, and if we, um, if, we, if we can put people in those positions uh, and they're more aware, then I, you know, I get better advice up the chain. Mm -hmm. I get a better understanding as to what we can deliver, um, how hard it is to deliver, and what's our sustained, what's our maximum sustained rate of effort so that I can deliver an Air Force that's continuously operating without burning people out being able to provide that advice to government, to the CDF, to say, this is what we can do. Um, if you want more to be done, then this is the resource cost that it will take. This will be the impact, or indeed this will be the risk that you're taking. Uh, so, and if I've got that from the bottom up as well, and they understand my intent from the top down, then I'll be able to provide better advice to the CDF, which equates to better advice to government. That makes us more effective as a joint force, it makes us more effective as an air force to deliver air power to the joint force. And overall, I think we'll, we'll be able to do a better job of delivering uh, on the national interests uh, and providing for the security and prosperity of this nation. Just one final question and probably uh, a difficult one in many respects. It, it's been a challenging time for Australian society. Bushfires followed by COVID-19. Uh, you know, the government's had to make some extraordinary measures to support Australian society and I, I don't think any of us uh, mm. complain about any of the measures that they, they've taken to uh, to uh, to keep us going and keep the economy going. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts were as we look at the forward estimates and defence and defence spending. Uh, you've got to have some thoughts that defence spending will come under pressure as, mm. as they try and rebalance uh, budgets that they've mm. spent over this period. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I, I was anticipating <laughs> this question at some point. Um, I think the uh, certainly the government's demonstration of their policy settings in the white paper is, is still um, around committing to the defence um, budget and expenditure that they committed to then. Uh, and the indications are, and I think the, the government is will try and, and certainly drive to ensure that they deliver on their promise there. Um, and. Uh, so, you know, around the defence budget, I think um, we are planning to be able to deliver against the budget we've been given and the commitment that government has made. Uh, and, indeed they, and indeed, they are directing us to do so. Uh, and, and the purpose of first principles was to make sure that defence got better at delivering responsibly with the resources they're given, to be efficient with those resources and be good stewards of the resource that we're given. So uh, that doesn't change. So um, we need to continue to demonstrate that we can do that. And if we can do that, and we demonstrate that our capabilities are what government needs in the current strategic environment, then you know, I, I think our funding uh, will be, you know, it will be demonstrated that that's what we need. But of course, I am a realist um, that uh, it's an immense amount of expense um, and cost to the, to the nation uh, as a result of COVID-19. 
I think I'd be foolish not to think that, that we might be impacted in some way and, and we would have to uh, contribute to how we build up and recover from, from such an, uh, an event such as COVID-19. Uh, we have very robust um, methodologies in place, the capability life cycle through our investment committee, the management across the strategic centre to prioritise what's important for our investment. You know, that, that's very, I think, robust and, and uh, it's very deliberate um, and it can be agile. Uh, so, uh, you know, we will respond to whatever government needs us to do, whatever tasking we're given, uh, whatever uh, resources that we are allocated in order to deliver against those tasks, and we'll continue to do our job to make sure we can explain in a clear manner um, for government to understand what it is that we can do, um, what the risks might be of, of doing certain activities or tasks uh, dependent on the resources and the capabilities that we have, and of course, as governments have always done, they will continue to balance those risks against what they need to do to deliver against Australia's national interest. Uh, this is not an easy time, um, but we need to be responsible stewards of the resource. We need to recognise that we need to pull together with the whole of the Australian community. Uh, we'll do our, bet, our, be, our bit, our part, our best uh, to deliver on the nation's security. Uh, and, uh, and we also are realistic that we have to be able to ensure the nation's prosperity in order to do the first. Uh, and you know, there will be some balance required here and some prioritisation. There's difficult decisions to make coming forward. No, thanks for that. But I, I think we should all be uh, heartened by, I think, what we've seen as a government's ability at all levels to handle a crisis and crisis mm -hmm. management. And I, I think that actually bodes well for an Australian future. Yeah. I think, um, certainly, I think Australia's uh, doing quite well in COVID-19, um, but is doing quite well good enough? And we all have to work towards that. Um, and we'll still be working through COVID-19, you know, COVID safe environment to deliver those operational capabilities that are so important to our nation. Um, and we'll do that uh, for the ADF. Let me, uh, let me just sort of uh, hone in on one particular point. There's been a lot of mm. commentary about firefighting and uh, you know, adapting C-130s and C-27s for it. I th think people understand what a specialist role that is. I just wondered what your thoughts mm. were on that sort of adaption of the, uh, the Air Force. Yeah, I mean, it is a specialist role. Mm. So, um, and, and there's no doubt Air Force could do a role like that. But uh, under our current force structure, the investment priorities that we've taken within the full range of defence missions that the government has, uh, you know, that we need to deliver for government. Uh, that means that our, our organisational structure for heavy airlift, um, C-130, C-17, even the C-27, um, there's a limited number of those. So if, uh, if we were to configure those for a direct firefighting role, then that would mean we take those assets away from other functions and other tasks that we need to perform as a part of defence. Uh, if I compare that to the way we do it with the commercial sector, uh, and the commercial sector that is prepared and focused purely on that mission, mm -hmm. um, or they prepare for the firefighting season and prepare the aircraft, the crews, in particular the crews, uh, to be able to operate in that, in that sort of uh, uh, high intensity, uh, manage the risks appropriately. Uh, and across Australia, I think the, you know, I'm, I'm um, anecdotal evidence here, uh, I think we're talking of figures up around the 300-odd aircraft that are used across Australia during our high-risk weather season, and particularly for bushfires. Um, compare that to, you know, eight or so C-130s and 10 C-17s and, you know, a, a small number of C-27s. Uh, we could do those tasks, but we don't really make a huge difference uh, across the firefighting area. But what we do do is we then support that large number of firefighting assets and we can support the domestic requirements by moving firefighters, equipment, fire retardant, um, food, water, evacuating personnel, uh, these sort of things that if we were to be doing those other tasks, they wouldn't be available. And I think you'll agree um, in the last bushfire season how critical that was evacuating people out of Mallacoota um, and bringing supplies and support into those areas that most needed them. Um, bringing in Army and Air Force water generation facilities and, and equipment so that we could provide water when 
uh, you know, water's been contaminated by bushfire smoke, ash. Um, so there's some of these really important capabilities. No, I, I agree with you. I think uh, people underestimate the logistics effort behind a lot of these operations. And, and while they would maybe like to see the ADF at the tip of the spear, it doesn't make sense when you've got, got organisations that have the specialist training and you can actually uh, supplement them with the whole logistics support, which yeah. is just as important as yeah. actual firefighting. And, and it is. Uh, and the, the skills that are required, I mean, uh, very clearly demonstrated in the tragic loss of the Coulson C-130. So, you know, it's a serious, mm. serious task. Um, uh, for us to be able to do that would mean a, a dedicated, a large amount of time. Um, our pilots are highly skilled. Our engineers are highly skilled. Our ground support crews all highly skilled. But to have them prepare an aeroplane and operate an aeroplane in that sort of an environment um, takes a whole bunch of additional training and effort that would have to commence well before the fire season. So, you know, that would mean that other tasks that government would give us, um, you know, we either have to buy a far more, far larger number of assets and equipment uh, and spend a, a, a large amount of the defence dollar on that. But as I suggested at the start, um, our task for Air Force in delivering air power to the Joint Force, the spread of capabilities that are required is, is very broad. Um, to be able to operate in that spectrum of conflict that I've explained requires all of those capabilities. They need to be up, ready, trained, prepared. Uh, and so any other actions that we take or uh, other actions and tasks that we accept uh, or are given um, would take away from some of those. And that's that's a key challenge for government and uh, and for us to be able to articulate our priorities in that sense. No, no, I, I uh, fully agree with you.